Ah, and let's go ahead and get going. Um, well, we're picking up in chapter five of Romans, and we're picking up at verse 15. Uh, last week, all we did was cover just a couple verses. I mean, we did 12 through 14, 12, 13, and 14, so a few verses. But where we are in uh, Paul's rendition is he's bringing the comparison between Adam and the problems that occurred through Adam. Because guess, guess what? Adam had free will. Everyone that God has created, the creatures that have sentience, the ones that are, have the ability to think and to act on their thoughts, and to interact have, the church you have yeah they all have the ability they all have the ability to have a i mean they all have free will um some would say well what about the animals well animals aren't sentient in that sense in other words they they do things but they're not they don't contemplate okay if i do this what happens or if i don't do this what happens they do things mainly instinctually that's the way god created whereas angels and us who were created in his image we do have free will and uh so that's why some of the angels disobeyed god and and they were judged immediately and they were thrown out of heaven along with satan who obviously had his own agenda and he wanted things his way well, because of that, we see that obviously there was some arrangement between God and Satan. It's not like when God threw him out, Satan was out of the picture forever and for good. Somehow God provided a, some flexibility in his, his level of freedom once he was kicked out. And so we see, obviously, that he must have been kicked out to this planet. And uh, because, I mean, we see that he showed up there with Adam and Eve and he tempted Eve. And obviously, he was able to beguile her, in other words, sway her into doing what God had said not, not to do. Uh, so when you look at that and you say, OK, so Eve sinned. She gave of the fruit to Adam. Adam sinned. We see this as a transgression or a trespass. Those are the terms that you usually see in the King James. And we'll use, Paul uses those terms. That's why I bring it up. Well, when you look at that trespass that Adam committed, that was no small thing. It's not like just crossing somebody's boundary line onto their property where it says no trespassing. In this case, trespass was something consider me considerably more egregious. We see that Adam actually transgressed the one and only commandment. And he only had that one, right, that we know of, right? That he, God told him that he was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day that he ate of that tree, he would surely die. Now, up to that point, I mean, there was a sweet relationship between God and Adam. I mean, God would come down and, and walk with him in the cool of the evening in the garden. They had a great time. I mean, it was personal, intimate, wonderful. And, but after the sin, what, what did Adam do? As, what did Adam do the next time God came down? He hid. There you go. He went and hid. And, and so God asked him, wait, 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 why? <laughs> What's up with the hiding thing? You know, are we playing hide and go seek all of a sudden? You know, and uh, so, and God throws out the issue. Uh, you didn't eat from the tree, did you? In other words, you didn't disobey me, did you? And of course, then the blame game started, right? Well, that woman you gave me, it was her fault. Oh, then Eve jumps in. No, it was that serpent. It was his fault. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> but we see that once sin came into the world, we see that Satan had been given flexibility to actually tempt, or the words that we really look at is to test Adam and Eve, to see if they would be obedient to God's established command. And obviously, 
yeah, you can say, yeah, but that, that was psychologically inapt the way Satan came about and did that, you know. No, the issue is, hey, God wanted to see what they would do. I mean, you know, some would say, well, wait a minute, God, was he expecting them to fall? I think God already knew what their limits were. And Satan, I mean, when God created, you know, Satan or Lucifer, Satan, I mean, he didn't create him as some dumb, dumb angel. I mean, this guy was crafty. And I mean, the Bible even says that. I mean, in, in our terminology, we say, you know, uh, sly like a fox, right? I mean, he was that type of individual. So, so he knew how to manipulate. And think about it. Adam and Eve were still very innocent. And so, I mean, he kind of had the upper hand already. He already knew sin because he had already sinned against God trying to usurp his throne. So he was able to convince Eve to eat and Eve gave to Adam and he ate. So we see the reason I bring up the picture again is in this intro is because we need to see what it is that Paul is talking about once we pick up in verse 15. But there was a trespass that happened. In other words, the transgression against God is what occurred. That is a trespass. So it is egregious in the sense that sin started in the world at that point in time. And with sin came death. And it wasn't just physical death, but immediately it was spiritual death. The physical death took longer. We see that, hey, Adam lived almost a thousand years, you know, 950 or 960, something like that. But we see that, and then he died. But in terms of the spiritual death, in other words, the breaking of the fellowship with God happened immediately. As soon as they took that bite from the fruit, their fellowship relationship was damaged and broken, the one between man and God. Um, now, God would have well been within his rights, right then and there, to say, that's it. Judgment says, no sinning against me. You sinned against me. You're done. I mean, he would have well been within his rights to do it because he's a righteous God. And I mean, he judged the angels that way. Once Satan sinned, we don't see that he was given a second chance. He and those that were following him had to leave <coughs> heaven. And so they were thrown down to earth. And so, I mean, as we look at that, we realize, okay, so we see how that happened now. God, as you had noted, had already given dominion over the earth to Adam and Eve, to Adam, basically. So, but obviously Eve was his helper, but Adam already had dominion of the earth. But when, when he sinned against God, he lost some of that dominion went to Satan. Okay, so Satan then became the prince of the power of the year, as we know. And he still has quite a bit of authority within that realm. He lost a lot of it when Jesus died on the cross because Jesus took some of it back. Now Jesus has control over spiritual death. Satan doesn't. And so, so we see that God is the one that's in control in that area. Um, but what we see is that the physical death didn't go away. We still die physically. All of us will die at some point. Hey, look at all the deaths that just happened within the last week. It's, you know, it's like, holy smokes. Yeah, I didn't mention, but Noel, for those of you who know Noel, he came down on Sunday because his father-in-law had another stroke. And today his father-in-law passed away. Oh. So, so that's another death in, in there, you know. Um, and it, it seems like it's just happened, like with Bill and Court Carroll's, you know, sister and uh, the Twitty, Mr. Twitty, you know, yeah. it's like, holy smokes, you know, it's like, man, they're going down like dominoes for heaven's sake. So, so, I mean, we're seeing that this is happening, but, and all of that comes from sin. Even Christians have to die. It's appointed unto man to die once the judgment, right? So we all are going to die because of that sin, because of that trespass, because that sin has been passed down. Now, it's not something that's passed down to where you say, OK, I want to sin. 
but that's what the pastor had talked about a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about original sin. Now, Paul's not addressing it in this part of Romans as original sin. He's just talking about the fact that there was a trespass and the trespass was problematic, okay? But see, when, when Jesus came, Jesus had to do something about it. That was God's love through Jesus that took on this issue of the trespass, of that sin, of the broken fellowship and broken relationship that happened because of that sin. And through Jesus now, we have a power to overcome in and through Jesus, okay? Because he paid the price for all of us. He paid the price for the sin. He is our strength to overcome through his Holy Spirit. So we've been given another chance is really what it comes down to. Adam took us into darkness. Jesus can bring us back into light and life, okay, through him. Now, everybody is potentially available to come into that saving grace, but not everybody will. And that's where you get in, I think I mentioned this last week, where you get into that issue of, are you a Calvinist or are you an Arminius? To me, I don't really like those terms because it kind of says, you have to believe this way. And the issue is, hey, we need to be a Bibleist. You know, we have to believe God's word. That's what's important. It's not about whose philosophy or theology interpretation is right. It's about leaning into the gospel and let the Holy Spirit teach us his word and learning together too. That's what's most important. So, I mean, hey, if you want to be a Calvinist wife, you want to be a, you know, an Armenian wife, all that really says fundamentally is the Calvinist is considered the most conservative. They believe the part where it says, hey, all the elect, you know, will come to Christ. So in their way of looking at it, they say God already knows who's going to come to Christ. So, hey, they're the elect, and they're the only ones that matter. But whereas the Armenia says, no, no, everybody has free will. You know, you can either accept or reject Christ. So it's through your free will that you make a decision whether you're going to come to Christ. But they are both right in their way, okay? But the Bible doesn't give us that flexibility. It doesn't say, well, if, you, if you're a free will person, you can do it this way. And if you're a conservative and you believe this way, okay, and only those that are going to be saved will be saved, you can do it that way. No, we all fall in to, we all fall in at the foot of the cross. That's what it all boils down to. Because Jesus paid the price, as far as we're concerned, since we don't know who's going to be saved, God is the only one who's omniscient. He knows already because he knows the future. It's not our place to determine who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. Our responsibility is to sow the seed and to tell others about the good news, about what Jesus has done. And do it in such a way to where we're not antagonistic, but loving. And so that the Holy Spirit can do a work in that person's heart. And hopefully then through that power, the, you know, the person will accept Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, will there be those that reject? Yes. But sometimes they may reject now, but maybe after hearing the gospel a few more times later, some of their barriers come down. The Holy Spirit can do the work in their hearts because it's God who saves, not us. So don't ever take it personally when somebody rejects you and say, I don't want to hear about that Jesus freak stuff or Bible thumping, or, you know, you know, the terms that I'm talking about, you know, but always be ready, though, to tell somebody about Jesus. It may be you have a testimony, maybe it's something, you know, that it shows that, hey, you've experienced something different in this life, and that through your, your appreciation of what's happened to you, you know, it's real. And a lot of times that's a way to get their hearts to open so the Holy Spirit can do the work in them and draw them into the kingdom as well. So the only reason I bring these two contrasts up, because this is what we're talking about with Paul, but he's not expanding on it like this. He's just trying to show that in Adam, we all die. 
And that's the key issue. In Adam, we all die. We die spiritually and physically, period. Okay, there, there's no reclama. In him, that's what happens to humankind if there was no other option. But God gave us an option. We see that he gave it first to the Jews and they had the law, but the law wasn't, the law wasn't there to make people a bunch of ritualists, but that's what they became. They became ritualists instead of people that wanted to know the lawgiver instead of being so locked up in the ritual of the law. But that's humans and humankind always wants to figure it out and do it their way. And it's easier to do works than it is to have a relationship with the living God, the one who gave the law. And so we see that, hey, the Jews, <laughs> even though they saw God's mighty hand in the works, still had their issues. They still, you know, I mean, it, if they ever had a period of time when they came close to God, it, it was very short lived. It wasn't like, okay, hey, yeah, boy, God opened up the Red Sea. We all passed through. He killed the Egyptians behind us. He freed us and he protected us. I mean, you would think something like that would be something that, man, it would be passed down through posterity, you know, like, man, look at this God who we serve. Look at the wonder he does. But how long did that last? Not even a few days before they were grumbling in the desert already, wasn't they? <laughs> they forgot that quick. So, I mean, when we look at things like that, we realize that, man, we really did damage our relationship with God by disobeying God in the Garden of Eden. And, well, we always throw it back on Adam because, well, that's where it all started. It started with Adam. Adam was the one that was given the law, the one rule, and Adam broke that law. It's as simple as that. And so because of that, Adam is the one that transfers that sin condition down through posterity, down through all of his offspring. And that's why Jesus could not be born of a human being, of, excuse me, of a human male, because he would have been born with sin. He would have been born into the curse. Jesus couldn't, that couldn't be with Jesus because Jesus had to be another Adam. He had to start in perfection, just like Adam did. And then let's see, could he sustain that perfection until he died? Now, you would say, well, wait a minute. Why did Jesus have to die if he did not sin? Because basically that's what would have happened with uh, Adam and Eve. If they had not sinned, they would, have had, they would have been able to eat from the tree of life. They would have lived forever right there and there. It would have been almost like heaven on earth already. You know, when it talks about the new heaven and the new earth. I mean, it would have been like that already. But since they did sin, well, we see where we're at today and what we're dealing with today. It's that problem that is there. That's all the Adam thing, okay? So that's why Jesus's father had to be God, had to be the Holy Spirit, because he was the, he, the Holy Spirit, re, it, in other words, started another Adam. In other words, he started out as perfect. Now, let's see if Jesus could sustain that perfection so that because the only way that he could be the acceptable sacrifice and die, because that was the law. The law was, hey, through sacrifice, you know, shed blood was the only way to be able without the shedding of blood is what Hebrew says. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So that had to happen to be able to be the remission. In other words the covering or the removing of that sin. And that's what Jesus did. That's why Jesus had to die is because that was the only acceptable sacrifice the father would accept to, dis to remove his wrath from those who had accepted that sacrifice. In other words, come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you know, for by grace, we are saved through faith. It's not a works thing. We can't go back and be like the Jews trying to be ritualistic. We have to be in Christ Jesus 
and seek him, have a relationship with him, that is more important than anything else we can do. Yes. Now, do we have to grow? Do we have to be through sanctification? Do we have to develop? Yes. But at the top of the list has to be our love for Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. And because of his death, we can have that relationship. See, before we couldn't have that relationship because guess what? We had sin. And sin is problematic. Sin keeps us separated. But through Jesus' shed blood, he covers our sin. He is our justification. That's another word that's going to come up today. What does justification mean? Justified. That's right. It means that in through justification, it's like at a court of law that the judge would get up, hit the gavel on, the, on his bench and say, not guilty. Okay. In other words, the price has been paid, whatever it was, the price has been paid. And because of that, the individual that is being charged will receive a not guilty appraisal because the price has been paid. That's justification. And that's grace, okay? We understand justification much better by understanding grace because we don't deserve it, but yet Jesus paid that price for us because he was able to be that second Adam without sinning. That gave him the, the position. I mean, some would say, well, not a very happy position, but gave him the position to be able to die for all sin and for all sinners. Because he was perfect. And that was the only acceptable sacrifice. Now, if he had sinned, like remember when he came up out of the desert after 40 days and he had been tempted by Satan already for 40 days, we only see the last three temptations. But he, hey, the whole time he was out in the desert for 40 days, he was being tempted. It was a testing period to see if he was going to fail. And that's why Hebrew says he was tested as much as any man. In other words, he knows everything that we go through. He's already had the experience, it, but yet he did it without sin. But look at us. <laughs> None of us can say that. Only Jesus could say it because he carried it out without sin, which made him eligible before the father to be that sacrifice. And that's why in the garden, he said, man, Lord, God, you can take this cup from me, take it from me, but not my will, but thine be done. Because he knew that was going to be the toughest time that he was going to have to endure. It wasn't the human death that was as problematic. Yes, although it was not going to be a good thing because he was human. He is totally human just as much as totally God. I think the heaviest load that Jesus had on the cross was taking on the sin, all sin past, present, and future for all humankind. That, to me, and, you know, where the father had to look away while this was happening because, you know, in God's presence, sin can't abide. Jesus had to endure it all. But yet, even in that, he was able to say, you know, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Hey, hey. And I think those are some perfect words that still fit today, okay? He's still interceding for us up there with the Father and still saying, man, Lord God, I know Ted sinned a whole lot, but forgive him. He's accepted me, Lord. He has accepted me as his Lord and Savior, and I've given him eternal life. Forgive him for this. I mean, you know, yeah, have patience with him. <laughs> so... But that's who we are. That's what Jesus does for us up there. He intercedes for us. So that's how he, as although this isn't the place where uh, Paul talks about him as the second Adam, it's where he does carry out that role that Adam fell short of and he was able to succeed under. And so that's what Paul is talking about. And that's where we're going to pick up in verse 15. Any questions? <clears throat> Really okay. good intro. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, man, it's, it's a big picture issue, you know, because it, it happened all the way from Genesis. Think about it all the way to when Jesus died on the cross. 
And then it picks up and then follows on and it will follow all the way up into the millennium. Yeah. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Mark uh, Milton. Uh, yeah, what we don't understand is God looked at us through the lens of Adam's sin until Jesus. And now he looks at us through the lens of Jesus' mm -hmm. righteousness. Amen. So he sees us as sinners because we were. Now he sees us as righteous because we're in Christ. Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you, man, we can't even begin to imagine how much that price really cost. You know, I don't think we'll even fully understand it when we get to heaven. But it was what needed to be done. And in God's <clears throat> matchless love, you know, we see him carry that out, even though it was such an exorbitant price to pay. God did it because he loves us. Yeah. And thank God for that, because, man, none of us would be in any position otherwise, any good position otherwise. So. Any other comments, questions? I just think about when he was praying, he, he sweat blood. That's how, yeah. you know, yeah. fervently he was praying. Yeah, talk about rough, right? I mean, yeah. man, you know that that was, you know, with groanings. I guess that's the way, you know, the, uh, the King James stuff. But it's like, he was just so, you know... Mm -hmm into it that he knew i mean understood the difficulty and everything but it was just a tough one but yet yeah even to the point where you know they say that's like you there's a condition they call it you know where you like your capillaries actually blow you know well, because of stress and everything else that's there and that's what jesus experienced while he was praying to the father yeah talk about rough understanding yeah. difficulty you know, is that when the disciples kept falling asleep? Yeah, that was the fine. <laughs> Three times he went back to them and they just couldn't keep their eyes open. Yeah. Yeah. Sad, isn't it? Oh, my. Uh, they, I don't think they understood the gravity. No, they didn't. They didn't. I mean, if you I mean, when you look at what they were going through, they just still didn't believe Jesus had to die yet, even though he had been telling them. They still just couldn't wrap their heads around that. And I mean, the Bible talks about like they had a veil. You know, they didn't understand it until Pentecost. Then they got, then their eyes were open, their spirits were brought to life. And then they understood what it was that Jesus had done. Look at Peter. He went out right away and preached the gospel on the temple stairs and 3,000 were saved that very first day. I mean, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Do we know how Romans got the name Romans, the book of Romans? Well, he, yeah, well, it's because of who they wrote to. It was written to the Roman believers. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that was why. Yeah. I mean, Paul wrote it from Corinth, you know, while he was there, I think, on his second missionary journey. When he stopped at Corinth, he wrote it. I don't remember his second or third, but that's when he wrote it to them because he knew he wanted to go to them. But the way he ended up there, remember, was on that shipwreck. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way he ended up there. And he didn't end up there of his own accord. He was being sent to Caesar to be tried, you know. So because he appealed to Caesar. So they were going to take him there and see, you know, it's not a good thing to stand before Caesar. I mean, especially if you're a Christian, OK. <laughs> But uh, that's how he ended up there in Rome, in Rome. But the letter had already preceded him before he got there. Okay. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you accomplished through Jesus. I mean, what amazing, incredible love. And we thank you for not giving up on us because, I mean, you were well within your rights and righteousness to give up on us because it seems like we just i mean it started with the jews look how much they failed you and yet you had showed them such mighty things and given them a perfect law and given them an ability to interact with you and they just went their own way and lord look at what you've given us today i mean man we have it so much easier through jesus christ i'm not saying easier in the sense of you know staying 
on the right path all the time through the flesh, but we need to lean into you for your strength and your power to overcome. Because you do say that if we walk by the spirit, we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. So I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just help us to walk in that way, to understand your word, to see the wonder you carried out through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and resurrection and what he's doing for us as he intercedes for each and every one of those who have come into relationship with him up there with you, Father. Now, help us understand more of what Paul is talking about here in this in this wonderful story of what it is that you carried out in an, an incredible love for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let, let's go ahead and bring up the scriptures here. And uh, now, I've already explained everything up to this point. And so I'm going to end up bringing up uh, verse 15 and pick up, pick up there. Because we talked about, you know, what what the problems were in the introduction and also in our, in our uh, study last week. So he goes off into verse 15 and he says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. Now, what he's talking about in terms of the free gift, he's talking about Jesus and the good news. He's talking about Jesus and grace. That is the free gift. In other words, that is what Jesus carried out that Adam, Adam fell down on. He didn't carry it out. And so that's why he makes the contrast, but the free gift, which is the good news in and through Jesus Christ, is not like the trespass. And that's why I brought up that term in the intro is because the trespass is the original sin. Although Paul's not specifically addressing it as that, that was where the testing happened that God had put before Adam and he failed. So that's the trespass. That was the fall of the first Adam, so to speak. But the success through the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, who gives us a free gift of life, a free gift of salvation, a free entry into relationship with him. But it's not just something that you, you know, you punch a ticket on and say, OK, the free gift, it's mine. It's done. I don't have to do anything anymore. There's a price to pay for accepting that free gift. Yes, the salvation is instantaneous and if your heart is right before the Lord and you're really focused on living for him, yes, it's done in a nanosecond. But there is a cost that comes with the free gift. And I think it's not being addressed as much in the churches today, and they need to address it. They, the people that come into Christ saving grace need to understand that, A, it doesn't mean there won't be any suffering or there won't be any problems. And that, hey, God just wants you to be rich and wise and, you know, this, this pers great person out there. Uh, no, that wasn't why he died. He died so we could have a relationship with him. And, I mean, I think King David put it right. And, you know, I think it was uh, Psalm 139 where he says, you know, uh, um, a broken and contrite spirit. Uh, you know, a, a, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you will not despise. In other words, when we come to the Lord, we don't come looking for this, you know, uh, sugar daddy who's going to give us everything we want. What, what, we look or, what we look for in him is a relationship, a humble relationship. The Old Testament talks about it as the fear of God. I mean, Proverbs talks about it in the sense of the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Um, so, I mean, and the fear of God doesn't mean, you know, you have such terror of him that you don't even want to talk to him because you're afraid he's going to zap you as soon as you sin one time. No, the fear of God is about a humbling, a respectful relationship with him, that you're holding God to his position. You're making him number one in your life and that no matter what comes, you rely on him to be your strength, to get through whatever situation comes, and that your relationship with Christ grows every day and becomes more intimate, more personal, and many ways to do that. I mean, obviously, through God's word. I mean, that's the best way. The second way is by growing in love and caring for one another. We talked about that in Sunday school, uh, you know, on Sunday. 
is where love plays out. How does agape love play out amongst the body of believers? Do we really love each other? Do we humble ourselves before one another? Do we consider others more important than ourselves? I mean, those are types of ways that we can come into a closer relationship, not only with Christ, but with each other. And that's the free gift. I mean, the free gift brings us into that, even though, you know, sometimes it may require some kind of cost. Like I said, agape love doesn't happen without sacrifice. And as Milton had put in class, without action, it has to have that fundamental work if it's going to work out. So when we look at coming into Christ, we look at the relationship first before the rest okay but when we walk according to the way god wants us to walk to where we're growing in our relationship with christ where that fellowship is being rebuilt and reestablished, that fellowship that was lost in the garden because of the original sin we can rebuild it today through jesus christ now regrettably the curse doesn't go away the curse is still there. That means that we're still, even in our Christian walk with the Lord, under the free gift, we will still struggle with sin. We will still struggle with the good and evil issue. Because, hey, guess what? That, that blasted fruit that Adam and Eve ate is still coming through all mankind, okay? And that good and evil is still problematic. And the biggest problem is that Satan took dominion much of man's dominion, and now he uses it to our detriment to try to get us to go by the flesh instead of walking by the spirit. That's how he attacks you and me as Christians and believers in Jesus Christ. He tries to put things in our path that somehow he thinks, okay, hey, this will definitely draw them away from the Lord because, man, it is going to be so sweet to the flesh that Man, they won't be able to say no to it. And we see that happens a lot in our, in, with our Christian brothers and sisters. Maybe it's happened to you. Maybe it's happened to me in our lives where there are things I don't want to do. And, and when we get to chapter 7, uh, we're going to see where Paul says, those things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Well, wretched man that I am, who's going to relieve me from this existence? You know, in other words, the struggle is always there. And King David even said the same thing. Now, granted, that was before Jesus, but he said, my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I son sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So in other words, the reality of the struggle of sin isn't something that can be displaced. Even in Jesus Christ, the struggle of it won't be displaced, but the forgiveness of it is there. Okay. And so we confess our sins. He's faithful and just forgive us our sins, right? We do that because we need to understand where our weaknesses lie and find what the root of the problem is and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to break that sin at that level, at the root area. What causes me to do this kind of sin? Or what is it that gets me into a, a tizzy about an issue that causes me to sin? And when you can identify that and ask God, the Holy Spirit, for his help and to get through that struggle, then we can be overcomers and victorious Christians in our walk with the Lord. But hey, we, we can't do it alone. If you think that in any way you can just be the best Christian on your own, guess what? You're going to fall. You're going to fail. In our own strength, we can't do it. I'll tell you, Satan is no, he's no pushover. Now, granted, in our strength through Jesus Christ, we have more power than he does, but we have to abide in him. We can't look to the things of this world and jump into him and say, I'm going to, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to do it my way and watch. I won't sin. If you do that, I guarantee you, you're going to sin. You're going to fall. But if you trust God and you say, I need your help to get through it, he'll be there for you. And, and then we won't fall into a trespass because, hey, that's what sin is. It is what caused the original trespass, the original sin. That's what did it because one fact of disobedience was all it took in terms of the sin. A disobedience against God's spoken rule was right there. And they, they missed it. 
They missed it, and we're dealing with it today, even as Christians. So that's what he's talking about there in that first sentence in verse 15. So he says, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, which abounded for many. Now, what he's talking about, the many that died is all humankind. Think about it. Every individual who is born is born into sin because the curse carries on. And that's why I had to mention Jesus earlier, how Jesus was born so that he wouldn't be born in to this sin, this death, this spiritual death. That's what he's talking about here. And all that happened because of Adam's sin. Okay. But the issue is when Jesus Christ died, he died for every single individual from Adam on. Okay. <clears throat> now, even though he died for everybody, the only way to take advantage of Jesus' sacrifice is you have to come into a personal relationship with him. We have to give our fallen life over to him and accept his free grace gift of salvation and then make him and establish him as Lord of our lives. He has to be Lord over all. We have to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength to our ability through the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, nobody can perfectly love God because, hey, one sin is enough to show we got some issues, okay? But in Christ Jesus, we have forgiveness for that sin. And I, I mean, that's the beauty of it. But when we get to chapter six, right off the bat, you're going to see that we don't have the right to sin just because we're forgiven. But we'll get to that as we get there. But the reason Paul, uh, Paul is bringing this out is because he wanted to make clear the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Now, notice it doesn't say for all, but his grace gift is available to all but not everybody's going to take it. There are going to be many that Satan is going to bamboozle, and just like he bamboozled Eve, they're going to be bamboozled into thinking, hey, why do I need that? That's just extra baggage. I don't need that religious stuff. I don't need that spiritual stuff. I'm fine the way I am. I'm a good person. Hey, man, God's got to love me because look at what I've done, man. I took that lady's trash out the other day. And I did these other, you know, great things for some people. That's good enough. But see, hey, one sin is enough to break us away from a relationship with God. And if we can't, if we can't be 100% perfect, which we can't because of original sin, then we can't, we can't have that intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's got to be all him through him. And then he gives us the other helper, which is the Holy Spirit. And we rely on him for his insight, his strength, his teaching, his understanding. He gives us that direction and guidance. So any questions so far on verse 15? Pretty deep stuff, right? Yeah. So in verse 16, he says, and the free gift, is not like the result of that one man's sin. In other words, some would say, well, yeah, I mean, why are they holding so much against Adam for just one disobedient act? Come on, it wasn't that big deal. That wasn't that big deal, big of a deal. So why, you know, are, are they, you know, just hammering Adam? You know, hey, I'm sure he could have, you know, resolved that with God and just said, hey, look, you know, man, maybe give me another shot or something like that. But the reality is a perfect God has to have a perfect subject. And if, if we, his creatures, don't fit into that, if we don't obey him perfectly, then we've got some issues. There's going to be a disconnect in relationship. Because, hey, the only way a perfect relationship can be maintained is it has to be between two perfect people. And we know, even though I make that sound like there are two individuals, 
But that the only relationship that is that way is between God and the Son. That is where perfection lies. Do we live up to that? I don't think so. You know, but that's what Jesus wants. He even prayed to the Father in John 17 that we would be one, united one, and perfectly one, just as he and the Father are one. Now, we're not going to achieve that here on this earth, not under the curse, but one day we will be with him. Thank God sin will no longer be that roadblock when we're up there with him. And we will finally be able to have that perfect, undisturbed relationship with God. And we can worship him freely, and there will be just that perfect love between God and his creation. And that's what we're looking forward to, praise God. So that is why he does that free gift. It, it, that's how that free gift results out of one man's sin. The gift is not like the result of one man's sin. In other words, the gift is for everybody. It goes way beyond what the sin was going to do. The sin was going to kill, right? The sin was going to kill everybody spiritually. That means for all intents and purposes, the way Paul is putting it, everyone that was under that sin would go to hell. But see, the grace of Jesus Christ that, uh, that came through overturned that sin and now gives life to people who accept Jesus Christ. Those people then no longer will, will be in a position to go to hell. They will be in a position to grow with their relationship in Jesus Christ. And to be more like him, to be light in darkness, even, even though they're still under the curse, they will be able to reflect Christ in light to people all around. That's why he's saying that the free gift is, uh, you know, goes beyond that original sin, the one man's sin that caused so much problem. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and we can represent him. And we can be a vessel worthy of his use to further his kingdom here on earth. That's what he's given us beyond what that original sin caused, which was spiritual death, total separation from God. Whoa, I'll tell you. And it takes a, a God of grace and mercy to get to this point. And that's deep love, folks. That is incredibly deep love that we don't deserve. But yet he did it anyway. And he even said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So praise God for that. So he says then, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. And sure enough, the condemnation was death for all mankind. Everybody from then on, from Adam and Eve on, would die spiritually and physically. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification and that's the word we were looking at that is total grace that is total forgiveness when we don't deserve it where god is saying through jesus christ like milton mentioned he sees us as righteous he sees us as perfect because he sees us through the lens of jesus's perfection through his sacrifice on the cross that was the acceptable sacrifice to the father that met the condition to forgive sin any and all sin for those who are in him. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Because, hey, if it wasn't for this justification through Jesus Christ, we would all be condemned forever. That means we would all go to hell because we could never stand up before the Almighty God because Romans 6.23 says that for all have sinned. I'm sorry, that's Romans 3.23. We know all have sinned, but it says the wages of sin is death. So in other words, hey, since we all have sin, the payment for that sin, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, and that's what he's talking about here. The free gift is what brings us out of that is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the result of the judge justification that he gives us that overcomes the condemnation. And that's why Romans 8, 1 says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who walk by the spirit and don't carry out the deeds of the flesh. I mean, it's about what Jesus did. It's about receiving the Holy Spirit as part of the, of the gift that God gives us through salvation is that we have the Holy Spirit as our helper to be with us, 
to give us direction and guidance. And it only works for those who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit does not work in people who have not accepted Jesus Christ yet. There has to be that relationship. So, so he goes back now and he kind of rebuilds the same argument. He says, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So it's a supernatural event. It isn't something we do. It's not like you or I can say, oh, look at what I did. Man, I, boy, I just really, I bamboozled Jesus into saving me. No. Hey, it's not anything we do, and that's that Ephesians 2, 8, 9 thing again. It's not by works. It's nothing we can do that puts us in a position to be righteous and have Jesus say, oh, I want Ted because, man, look what a nice guy he is. No? It's, yeah, it doesn't work that way. Because for one, Ted is not a nice guy, okay? He's got issues just like everybody else. But it's through Jesus Christ and what he did that is where the grace abounds, the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign. It's all through Jesus. It's in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. It's the only way. There is no other way to saving grace except through Jesus Christ. No good deed, no, no perfection, uh, or at least the way we see ourselves, nothing the way we do business can bring us into a perfect relationship with God. Only a relationship by grace, justified through Jesus Christ, can we, can we build on that relationship in Jesus Christ. So any questions up to verse 17? Okay, verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, and he's repeating it again. Remember, when he repeats something twice, he means it as, hey, it's important. But if he repeats it three times, it's established, okay? <laughs> he's up to the third time. Yeah, go ahead, Milt. You need to move your scriptures up. What's that? Move your scripture verses up. Oh, oh okay. It's, okay, let me see here. Uh, yeah. Oh, you don't see verse 18? No, now we do. Now we do. Oh, oh, hang on. Where did I go? Do you see it now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So he says in verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, man, and it's amazing. The trespass was just, I mean, today we look at it as, well, it was no big deal. Okay, he just, you know, he had a weak moment and he ate. No big deal. But hey, that's all it took. A lot of times we, we tend to want to say, especially now that we've seen so much sin in the world, we tend to categorize sin, don't we? Oh, well, if you murder somebody, that's a bad sin, especially if it's premeditated. Or if, you know, or what about somebody, oh, if he's a child molester, that's a bad sin. Um, you know, we tend to categorize sin. But see, we were already born into separation from Christ because of sin, okay? We were born into that condition. It's only through mercy and grace that children before the age of accountability are taken to heaven. It's because of his grace, but it's because he forgives them because they're innocent. But the issue is as soon as they pass that age of innocence, they're just like the rest of us. We're just as responsible for our actions before the Lord. And when we sin, we're responsible for it. So that's why he's saying, because of one trespass led to condemnation for all men, that's still uh, problematic. One sin keeps us from having a relationship with the Lord, Lord God unless we seek him and accept his free gift of grace. He says, so one act of righteousness in Jesus Christ leads to justification and life for all men. So again, he repeats it a third time. It is in Christ Jesus that we get life. As Romans 6.23 said, it's eternal life, okay? It's not just life in general, like as if, okay, you know, my dead soul, my dead spirit has been revived. I've been born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, 
but that I have come into a new place in life. I've come back into a relationship that Adam had before he sinned. We are actually, when we come into that relationship with Jesus Christ, that is actually where we stand. We stand as if we had never sinned before the Father. And that's why you and I can go directly to the Father now. And that's why we are a royal priesthood, as Peter talks about in 1 Peter. Because through Jesus Christ, the Father doesn't see any of us as sinners who have come into a saving relationship through Jesus Christ. He sees us as just as perfect as Jesus. We said that earlier, but I just wanted to repeat it because that is how he sees us. Now, that doesn't give us a right to just do anything we want to sin, but when we get into chapter 6 next week, you're going to see exactly why Paul reiterates that. And the reason he reiterates it is because that's what people want to believe. They want to believe the easy grace, the easy gospel, and they cheapen it by saying, well, hey, you know, so what? So what's a sin or two? Well, I think that's really minimizing it too much, but what's a couple dozen sins or so? Uh, but they, the thing is, is that they say, well, hey, since Jesus forgives by grace, I can go out and sin. And hey, guess what? I give Jesus more bang for his buck because he died on the cross so he can show more grace by forgiving me. So, hey, you know, Jesus, hey, it's a win-win. I get to have fun and Jesus gets to, you know, get the glory for having forgiven me my sin. But you're going to see that Paul talks about that because obviously I think Christians back then were trying to take advantage of what they thought was a loophole that they could still live in the world and yet, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, you know, still think that they had that fire insurance card in their back pocket if they had a back pocket. So that's why he's talking about um, how what Jesus did actually acts for righteousness leads to justification life for all men who come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So he says in 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And remember, he's repeating. So, I mean, it's obviously important for him to repeat it this much. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And again, the foundational principle is Jesus Christ and him crucified. I mean, we've heard that term before, but that is the central action that was required by the father to meet the need that needed to be met to restore relationship between man and God. So imagine, if even, you know, some would say, well, wait a minute, didn't God establish relationship between man and God with the Jews? I think there were a chosen few that maybe came into that, that really truly sought the Lord, like Abraham, more than anybody else, you know, and he personally had a relationship, but for the Jews in general, I mean, I think they were, that God was just carrying them along by his grace because, man, they were stubborn, as, as Moses put it, or God put it to Moses and Moses to God. They are a stiff necked people. In other words, they're going to do whatever they want to do regardless. And even to the point where God wanted to get rid of them, he is like, I'll start over with you, Moses. And Moses had to stand in the gap for him, right? So when you look at things like that, you realize, hey, this problem with sin is not new. And it's, be, it's, it's been something that Satan has used to try to bring down any of God's plans. And he's still at work trying to do as much as he can to bring down God's ultimate plan. So, so we keep our eyes on the Lord. We don't go sin just because we want to and know that Jesus is going to forgive us. No, we want to walk in righteousness. We want to walk by the spirit so we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. But if we are weak, we know that he will forgive us when we confess our sins. But also we know, like Paul said, you know, when he prayed to the Lord, you know, about taking the thorn out of his side, as he wrote in Corinthians, remember the problem with the thorn in the side, which is usually an indication of a serious problem. God told him, you know, hey, stop asking for me to take that thorn out of your side. He asked God three times and God said, stop it. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength 
is made perfect in weakness. So he understands our condition. He understands that we are weak. So when we do stumble, he is right there to help us and pick us up. And he is there to help us to walk in righteousness as we grow in him. Okay. But we aren't, we aren't going to be totally cleansed. I mean, we're cleansed of our sin totally, but we're not going to be cleansed in the sense of being relieved from this old nature until we get to go be with him. Once we are with him, yeah, praise God. Hey, hallelujah. Then, man, I can't wait for that day because I don't want to have to worry about, man, Lord, I sinned again today. Why, am, why do I have sin? I don't want it. But yeah, look at me. What's the matter with me? Oh, wretched man that I am. I can understand Paul's groaning prayer about that issue. Because it's like, I don't want to. But yet it happens. Shame on me. So, so it's real. So we see that through Jesus, though, we will all be made righteous. God still sees us as righteous, even in our, our problems, even in our accidents, even in our weaknesses. He gives us the strength to endure. So in verse 20, he says, now the law came in to increase the trespass. Now, he, you say, what, 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 what do you mean by the law came in to increase the trespass? Well, we also saw in scripture where he's, Paul says, if there was no law, there was no trespass. We talked about that earlier, but it's law that pointed to the problems and the weaknesses man has that are contrary to God's way. And when that law is in place, all it does is brings recognition that what we're doing is sinful when we go against those laws, right? So he's saying the law came in to increase the trespass. In other words, the law increased the trespass because of the fact that now it's made us aware of where our weaknesses lie and where we usually end up stumbling and failing. It's not about trying to keep the law. The, all the law does is points to the fact that we are weak. Try to keep the Ten Commandments for one day and tell me if you succeed. You know, I mean, the reality is there is always something that comes up that causes us to want to do things our way. Or, man, all of a sudden we'll get angry with somebody without ever even thinking about it. We just fly off the handle and it's like, Lord, that's not what you want. That's not, you know, that's not how you want me to act with people. You want me to love people, not to, you know, fly off the handle that way. I mean, the, those are tough issues. I mean, they are real, but they are tough. And the issue is they are sinful. God wants us to love others. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you, it's not an easy thing. And that's why we can't do it in our own strength. We have to totally depend on him. That's why we need that special relationship with Jesus, that justification and the, the, the obedience that Christ laid out that make us righteous. We need him so that we can overcome our weaknesses where the law abounds and just shines a light on the fact that we have sin. Even in Christ Jesus, we sin. So he says, but where sin increased, Grace abounded all the more. Now, this is one of those scriptures that I've heard and taken in some of the churches that still preach about sin, but they want to make it sound like, hey, grace is all you need. Hey, don't worry about the sin. Your grace is taken care of. But that's not what it's saying here. What it's saying is that, you know, yes, is Christ enough to forgive our sin? Absolutely. But it's not an excuse to sin, to actually go seek sin in our lives. But if anything, we're going to talk about that later, where it says that we are no longer a slave to sin, which is the old nature, but we are now slaves to righteousness. Mm -hmm. Are we living in that righteousness in Jesus Christ? Or are we still letting the world be or the major influence in our lives? And that's the issue he's talking about here, okay? Okay. Yes, God knows our weaknesses. You know, that's why he could say, again, I repeat what he said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because we truly do struggle with things that Satan throws at us in the world. It just tells us that we need to seek him more daily, to walk with him closer in all that we do, so that, yes, we get the grace, 
but we will walk more in his righteousness through his power in and through the Holy Spirit. So verse 21 continues the thought. He says, so that as sin reigned in death, okay, because that's what sin is, Romans 6, 23, sin and death are like this. So as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the whole answer to the whole problem is right there. He's saying that it is the grace issue that Christ carried out on our behalf that has put us in a position to have that personal intimate relationship with him. And through that, he gives us strength in and through the Holy Spirit to overcome our problems of this world that get thrown at us through the, through the evil one and through the way the flesh is, the old nature likes to kick in sometimes. But in Jesus Christ, as we look to him, we, for those areas where we stumble, he is there to pick us up, cleanse us, and keep us going in the right direction. And that is walking in his righteousness, walking in his love, walking with his hands on us. And I mean, I like how King David puts it, you know, as he hems us in behind and before, and he puts his hand on us. In other words, that's a sign that he's given us direction, given us, you know, where we need to go. And it says, you know, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is, it is basically extreme, too hard for me to even understand. And that was a matter of, of what David experienced even before Jesus about God's grace and mercy on him when he had his sin problems. So that is where Paul is bringing this whole story out. He's bringing it in the sense that it's through Christ that everything happens to bring us into the right standing and right relationship with him. And it needs to be, although he's not saying it here, I'm saying it, it needs to be a daily thing because guess what? If you aren't doing, if you aren't daily seeking him, daily pursuing him, daily walking with him, praying to him throughout the day, just because you see something and you want to make him part of it, bring it into your prayer item, bring it into your prayer life, make it, make it so that your daily relationship with him is focused so much on him that the world doesn't have a chance to distract you and cause you to sin. I'm not saying you're going to be able to achieve that with perfection, but I'm saying that is a way to continue to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, to reflect him, to show his righteousness to others. And others will see it in your life, too, because they'll say, well, wait a minute, why, why don't you do these fun things? Or, and, you know, it's their definition of what is fun. And the bottom line is, hey, you, we have more fun in Christ Jesus than really this flesh has to offer. You know, I mean, I've, I've not found any sin yet that doesn't have consequences. You know, that you can just say, wow, that was great. I love that sin. That's the right one. You know, I don't need to be forgiven that one because, man, that one, uh, hey, I never get in trouble because of that one. Hey, sin is sin. <laughs> and that's the reality of it. You can't try to pigeonhole it and make it better. Sin is anything that is contrary to God's plan, purpose, will, and desire in anyone's life. And there are establishments of in the Bible that that totally bring out those things that potentially can be sent. As a matter of fact, James even says that if something that you're doing is to you is sinful, it is sin. It doesn't have to necessarily be written in the scripture. It's because God gives us an insight as to those things that are contrary to what he wants us to do. So he's saying, if you get that nudge from the Holy Spirit, that what you're doing isn't right, then you need to address that. Take it under control right away. You know, repent and confess it and repent. Get out from under it because it's a problem. It's not something that we want in our life. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. It also breaks our relationship with the Lord. You know, yeah. when, when fellowship. we see our fellowship, uh, it, um, you know, it, it, the, you, one day you'll have the joy of the Lord in your life. And then when you sin and you don't confess it, there goes your, uh, you know, what'd you just say? Your joy, your joy in him. It's it, because fellowship, it's the fellowship. Yeah, your fellowship. Yeah. Uh-huh. And sin does that. Oh yeah. 
hey, sin is a big problematic issue. I mean, I, sometimes, and I think that we need to be come back to that in our churches to address it because it's sin is more real today than it's ever been. I mean, there everything out there just tries to bring you into a sinful condition. I mean, look at the TV. Look at where it was 20 years ago and look where it's at today. I don't watch TV. I watch, you know, I do watch, you know, like shows, but I pick things that have played in the past. I don't watch any of the new stuff because, man, it's, it's all, you know, just trying to drag you into sinful conditions, you know, sexual things. It's like, yeah. man, homosexuality. It's uh, everything is just like, yeah, everything's fine. There's no problem. Whatever you want to do is fine. And that's, if you look at sitcoms today, it's, man, it's like, holy smokes. How can people think that that's acceptable, you know, no. behavior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we don't, don't watch sitcoms of any kind. Of any kind. Yeah, exactly. So I, I don't mean, even watch TV. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Because, I mean, well, that's another thing that sometimes I, maybe I watch too much. I, because I keep asking the Lord, you know, to forgive me. It's like, Lord, am I, I, I could, should be doing, if I'm just sitting here watching the tube, or I mean, a program, I could be doing something else for him. You see the issue? And, I mean, it, it convicts me. Uh, so, I mean, I've got issues too. You know, and some would say, oh, but that's not a problem. Well, like James said, if it's sin to you, it, it's sin. And so yeah. to me, it bothers me. And I do confess it to the Lord. And I say, Lord, you know, minimize, let me minimize this time, you know, that I'm doing with that so I can spend more time with you. Because, I mean, that's the reality of it. I mean, he wants more time with me. And if I'm going to be, amen. And if I'm going to be with him forever and ever in heaven, shouldn't I be working toward that goal even now? Yeah, I, I think so. Well, and I think a lot of it too, Ted, it's like, just think of people everywhere I go, I see people with a phone in their face. <laughs> yeah. Driving down the road. I mean, it's like, if you don't watch out, they're going to run into you because they're looking at their, they're looking at their cell phone. Hey, it just uh, stop bothering me there a minute, Sandy. I got a new text here. Hang on. Let me see what this is. On me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's so true. They're always texting, aren't they? Yeah, it sure <laughs> seems that way. Doing game playing. I mean, I see them going dick, 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 on their phones and it's like, what in the world are you doing? Where are you doing that so fast? I wish my fingers could move that. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Sure enough. I know. I think sure I think this just that's just a new creation for Satan to just really use it. And yeah. how he and how he is using it. I mean, hey, I I'll tell you, he's active. Yeah. Yeah, he's active out there. And I'll tell you, he, he wants to suck anyone in that he can, and he will do it for Christians. If people think, oh no, nah, man, Satan's no big deal, I tell you. I'm not, don't give him more credit than he's due, but at the same time, don't fall into his traps. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he'll do a lot of stuff to keep you away from uh, the Lord. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you don't have time to do Bible study today. You got to get busy doing this, or you got to do this, or you yep. got to keep, sometimes keeping a Christian too busy is not good. I'm with you. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, we just we just get up and do our Bible study. Of course, it's not a a, a drudgery for us. We love it. Yeah, and you it know, should it should become that for every Christian if it's not that already. I agree. Yeah, you know, we've been doing doing our Bible study in the morning for many many years, and we love that. But Amen. there are times, you know, when you wake up and you're not feeling real good. But you know, the minute you open that Bible, it just seems like that just goes away. Amen. Amen. I agree. I agree. I do it every morning myself, too. I mean, I can't get my day going without it. Right. Yeah. Good Amen. day. Me, too. Amen. Us, too. Okay. Amen. I'll tell you, it, it's, it, it's just like, you know, I mean, in the Lord's Prayer, where it says, give us this day our daily bread, not just physical, but spiritual. Right. Amen. Yes. Amen. Me too. Amen. 
<laughs> awesome. Oops, what did I just do? Oh, there we go. Okay, well, that's our lesson for this evening. Any other questions, comments, agreements, disagreements? Yeah, go ahead, Milt. I don't remember hearing you push the button for record. No, it's up there. It's recording right oh, now. Okay. Oh, <laughs> man, stop making me sweat again. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, see you're trying to get me to sin man i was about to give an expletive here you're gonna have to hear a beep or... <laughs> i've heard that before when god sees us he doesn't see us he sees jesus but when you put it in words you said we can stand before God as somebody that's never sinned. That made me want to just get up and jump up and down and celebrate. Isn't it? I mean, what? I mean, isn't that amazing? You know, to where, I mean, he doesn't see. We, we are, I think we're our own worst enemies where sin comes in, where Jesus abounds. Is that we, I think we castigate ourselves more than he does. In his grace, he wants to forgive us. He wants to show his love. We're the ones, I mean, I even pray sometimes, Lord, I am so ashamed. Why did I do the sin? I mean, it's like I should have had control. And it's back to the I should have, you know, had control over this. And it's that flesh thing. Yeah. And it's like, I'm sorry, Lord. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And yeah. I confess it. Forgive me. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I think that's an issue, too, is I think sometimes we judge ourselves a lot harsher than what Jesus's grace provides for us. Yeah, I yeah, think so, I too. I think so, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but, hey, praise God for that grace, because, boy, without it, where would any of us be, right? Right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay, well, let me stop the recording then, and uh, we'll go into the prayer time. Unless anyone has one final comment or something you want to make.